Great relationships don't just happen. They're designed. Why leave love to chance when you can make strategic decisions in your relationship just like you do in your career? The days of settling for mediocre are over. Welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. I'm Dr. Jolie Hamilton. And I'm Ken Hamilton. Join us as we explore the decisions and choices that make relationships work no matter what life throws your way. It's time to reimagine relationships from the ground up. Welcome to Project Relationship. Hi, welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. I'm Dr. Jolie Hamilton. And I'm Ken Hamilton. And today I have a question for you. Oh, Here we go. Yay. <laughs> so vacation sex, why is it so good? Oh, that's a good question. Okay. Um, our vacation sex specifically or all vacation sex? Because I've had some good vacation sex with a lot of people. Okay. <laughs> but... Yeah. Um Gosh, uh, well, let's talk about in general first. Okay. If you find yourself relating specific examples, feel free. So vacation sex, this is a good time to ask me because we're in a weird spot right now because I've been on vacation and you're not. So I'm having vacation sex and you're not. How's that going, by the way? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah, I'm not having vacation sex. <laughs> Actually, it's been really interesting because it is. it, it still has felt real it like i can feel the um uh, the increased pleasure that i get and not maybe not the same level mm -hmm. as when we're you know in california in a hotel and there's you know no cares um but it is increased the oh. the pleasure level is increased so i'm going to go with my first guess being the relief of stress okay it's not just a guess i have <laughs> done my homework but the relief of stress is huge. So you're saying sex <laughs> with uh, like a layer of stress wrapped around it is not as good as stress without the layer of stress wrapped around it. Stress without the layer of stress wrapped around it is what you just said. And that's very funny. Well, it's like I'm not worst, on vacation. It's like so. the worst Rolo ever. <laughs> okay. Um, no, okay. I <laughs> think that... <laughs> that is really a bad not. Rolo. That's a, that's a right. oh, slip. Is... I think we should dig into further. Stress with a stress core. Nice. Okay. I think that when when we're talking about vacation sex, one of the things we're fundamentally talking about is sex during a time when we have decided to set down a bunch of our day-to-day -day stuff, our day-to-day okay. -day responsibilities. So first we define sex, then we define vacation, then we can talk about vacation sex. You are married to a scholar. All I right. always want to find terms first. Okay. So, right, for us, our shared yep. definition of sex is the overlapping of our erotic stories mm -hmm. in particular when we do it with our physical bodies yep. but we but not restricted we, yeah not restricted yeah. to that but in particular so then on top of that vacation is a time when we are intentionally setting down some of the banal stressors yeah and sometimes vacation is when we've actually removed ourselves from our our day-to-day -day home context, mm -hmm. right? So a change of context. Those three things all together, they do make for something pretty special, pretty awesome. I think that it's not just the removal of stress. Okay. What else you got? I think that it's also the enlarging of my imagination. There's more space for me to imagine it's not just new, like, I don't want to be reductive about it. It's not just like new sexual positions or something. It's, I can let myself sink into fantasy more deeply when I'm not feeling that layer of stress. Okay. Or when I have removed myself from my, my home context, which is tied to responsibility. Responsibilities, that's what I feel, yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe that's an even better word. It's not even... Maybe home life is feeling great and not stressful at all, but there's but still, still a lot of still filled with things to do. Yeah, I walk around the house. I see a million things that I could be doing, and they can be distracting. Right. So I've been having an increased imagination and ability to ask for more of what I want in bed or not in bed, <laughs> and also um, less 
rush. I'm not feeling rushed. I'm not worried about whether we get to sleep exactly at a certain time. I'm not, oh, yeah. not feeling that pressure. Mm -hmm. But you have continued to work your, your, your 60 hour weeks, which is typical for you right now. Um, it's been a very busy time for you at your job. And so, so have different, that's very different. Yeah. Um, how's it been context. for you? Uh, good. It has been, well, it's been actually very good because your increased access to erotic imagination lets the story that we share expand, even though um, mine is a little constrained. I can ride yours a little. Uh, that pun just sort of makes itself. Yeah, anyway. I would say, I would apologize, but you knew what you signed up for when you were listening to us <laughs> talk, right? Okay. So now that you're riding my imagination. Yes. Okay. I mean, yes. <laughs> I, I think that vacation sex has always been a thing for us. And when I'm working with clients, it is frequently brought to me that they have good vacation sex, but they're not like their sex life isn't working the way they want it to at home. And mm -hmm. so I take that to be a great sign because they still, they're having the capacity to overlap their erotic stories yeah. and engage with each other in some times of their life. It's not that they're completely out of alignment, but when responsibility takes premacy and yeah. it's always at the forefront, they're struggling. Um, I have some clients who will talk about struggling with um, just a lack of interest, but, but not low desire specifically. It's like they want to want to, but they can't quite find their want. I mean, I've definitely been there. I'm thinking, oh, I would, I would really like to have sex today. And then the weight of tomorrow comes in I'm like, mm. okay, so there's things I have to think about and I want to save my energy for tomorrow, forgetting that very often sex generates energy rather than using it up for me. Um, but yeah, I, so let's differentiate then when we talk about, um, the amount of desire someone has, mm -hmm. it's really common to pathologize high desire or low desire. And I'd like us to do a whole episode on this, yeah. on sexual discrepancy. Like let's do a whole episode, but in the context of vacation sex, even, even there, like there, it's important for us to say there is no right amount of sex to want to have. So I have a little bit of trouble taxonomically when we say low desire or high desire, what are we talking about? I have exactly? been wondering what metric are we using? What are we, what are we looking at? What's the thing that is discrepant? Right. What's the so something that um, happens a lot when I'm talking to people about this is they'll, I'll, I'll ask them how frequently they're having sex. And this is after I've had them describe to me what sex is for them. And then I'll ask them how frequently they're having sex. And they'll say, well, the usual amount, mm -hmm. like regular. And I'm like, I don't know what mm -hmm. that means. I'm going to need you to share a little bit more about what that looks like for you on a weekly or monthly basis or yearly basis. How much is, is typical for you? And then I have them compare that with how frequently they would like to have sex. Okay. Yeah. But then there's a really important part about taking ownership over the amount of sex I want to have is not what determines whether you have low desire or high desire. Right. So I have to remember yes. that my setting for like what I base my, my version of normal on, right? The word, whatever the word normal, typical say, what I've based my desire amount on is for me and you have your own. And then in, in the in-between, in the space between the two of us is this conversation about what it is that we want to make happen between us sexually. And we have had specific conversations around that. Around frequency. Yeah. And then vacation comes in. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it actually can be the, the catalyst for some uncomfortable conversations. Because if all of a sudden sex is really easeful and fun and joyful, but then you find yourself at home and, you know, another week goes by and you're like, oh my gosh, we are exactly back where yeah. we were before. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I find is important is to notice what my expectations are. Did I think that somehow it was just about 
like breaking the seal or like, like just getting, mm -hmm. having sex again. And then we'd want to have sex on the same schedule again, or at the same um, sort of ramped up desire level or the same kinkiness level. If that, if I was counting on vacation sex to sort of carry over, sometimes it does, but it doesn't always. Yeah. You and I have come home from some trips, in fact, and just found like a whole, a whole week will go by. I'm like, I got nothing. I'm just, all I feel is the weight of having come back to a household that isn't working in the way that I, I in a way that leaves me feeling open and right. supported and yep. ready to approach vulnerability. So, Cause that's, what's necessary for me. There's a level of vulnerability. vulnerability and vulnerability in the context of sex for me anyway, means I would like to feel safe in being vulnerable. I don't really want to take risks that way. Right. I'd like to be vulnerable and know that I will be safe. And in that's that context I can reach. So this is how vacation can be defined for me. <laughs> it Vacation isn't about whether I leave my house. A vacation is about whether I get to set down my responsibilities yeah. or how many of those responsibilities I get to set down because it's not all of them. I have children. Um, I have a business. But how much of that responsibility can I set down? And then how safe do I feel? How, how safe do I feel to really relax, mm -hmm. to deeply relax in the center of myself? And so that can be done at home, or at least that's what I'm finding. And we've had other vacations at home. So we, we knew that this was possible, but it, it's not as easy as it is when we can remove ourselves from our home context. Yeah. Um, the other reason it's not quite as easy though, is we have all these kids around. Okay. Well, that teenagers. was one of the things I was thinking about the, about the context of our home in particular. There are other people around yeah, there are other when people we go around. on vacation, those people are strangers and further away. Yeah. And, and you're in a hotel, you're in an Airbnb yep. and there's, there's generally you, you understand the parameters. So I frequently get asked the question, well, how do I have, you know, how do I deal with the fact that I have kids and, you know, like, where does sex even fit? Because kids often, you know, they wind up, especially when they're little, they, they come in in the middle of the night, they have a bad dream, your sleep's disrupted, maybe you're co-sleeping. There's a million reasons why it can be more difficult. A lock on the bedroom door is a good thing. Yeah. A lock on yep. the bedroom door is a very, or the bathroom door, or both. <laughs> They're good. A, conven a, a convenient room with a lock. So on. one of the things that we do to um, enforce this vacation mode that I'm in is to tell the kids I'm on vacation. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we do to normalize the fact that sex happens between consenting adults is to say, we are going to have private time. Yep. Leave us alone. Don't knock on our door right now. Our kids are all over 14. So it's, it's very easeful. We'd be looking for, you know, we'd be looking for a different setup if the kids were younger. But I have felt empowered to prioritize that part of our relationship the whole time because I intuitively recognize that if we couldn't prioritize our sexual connection, each of us struggled yep. in our own way. Yeah, and we, I see we, people struggle with this every day. We find that to be very true in our relationship when our when our, when the sexual aspect of our, of our relationship is pushed aside for other things, it will fairly quickly start to be, to be evident in, in yeah, it, troubles. Or... It comes out in other ways. It starts to creep up on us as um, bits of resentment here and there mm -hmm. or shortness with each other, um, constriction of our language, yeah. a lack of like the small touches throughout the day. Yeah which doesn't mean I want to force it, but in order to create an environment that feels conducive yeah. to that day-to-day -day intimacy, well, sex begets sex in our context and in many people's context. Keeping the broadest definition of what sex can possibly yes. be. I want it like a very right, broad definition. Very broad. This isn't about orgasm seeking. This isn't about penetration. It's about sharing intimate sexual context in a way that feels mutually beneficial and yummy. But I see people all the time who are struggling with feeling like that's not appropriate anymore, mm. feeling overwhelmed by their responsibilities or feeling like 
feeling like it just doesn't fit into their life and it's frivolous. I have definitely felt that in in past lives of mine in my previous How about marriage. All that's... of your life except maybe the last like five years. Yeah. Even. Yeah, right. That that's a good point. Even okay. early on in our relationship. So uh what what uh, recommendations do you have for people in this situation? So here I am at home having trouble figuring out how to uh, um, facilitate sex. Yeah. And eroticism. And eroticism. So eroticism is about energy. You know, when people, I, the, the old phrase, you know, how's your libido? Libido, mm. the, the, like the, word, the use of the word libido. Libido is just life force. It's not about sex. It, not in the psychology I study. It's about your life force. So one of the first things is I want to check in on how is your life force feeling? Yeah. Like, are you feeling okay. de-energized across the board? Because some other things could be going on. There could be depression. There could be situational stress. There could be secrecy. There could be, um, a, there could be crying, like pain, just physical pain that's going on. Pain, there are any grief, grief, like the natural responses to the world right. that you're in. There could be all sorts of things that Worry are about actually a pandemic? layered on top of yeah, right. the day-to-day -day responsibilities. So I want to dig into that. But then I also want to ask people to reflect on how important do you think sex is allowed to be? Ooh. Because when you and I were first together, um, we would have these conversations about sex and I, and I would think, well, wow, here's a guy who really is interested in, in sex and in sexuality, in, in connecting to the erotic. Um, but you were pretty insistent that it fit around the edges oh, of everything. Oh my, yes. Like you, yep. you would only put it in these like tiny little crevices and corners of your life. And I wouldn't claim it as, okay, this is a, this is, I want sex to be part of this day. It's your recreation. Yep. Right. You, uh, you, that's how I see it now. You, you treat it as recreation for yourself, but not then. Yeah. And even if I did, I fit recreation around the edges. So that was about knowing what I want and making time for it in my life, making energy space for it. So there. Life. So there's a thing. Vacation sex is yummy in part because it's vacation sex, because you have made some space for pleasure and enjoyment and relaxation. Mm. And I would contend that all of us need to find pl a place for pleasure and relaxation and enjoyment in our day to day. Yeah. And so I watched you fit that stuff in along the edges and what stood out to me, but didn't it didn't seem to fit into your narrative at the time but later it did um shame well uh, yep the the reason for cramming not just sex but any pleasure yeah appeared to be this sort of almost a uh, fervent disowning of pleasure and you and I grew up with a very similar um, religious background and yep. cultural background. Our parents shared a lot of context. And yet you seemed to like feel permeated or something. There was like something about all of the, all of pleasure that seemed to feel sort of inherently shameful. And yeah. but correct me if I'm wrong. I, mean, I don't want to speak for you. What what was that that was happening that was leaving it? So because we, we would go away on vacation. And you could have sex and like all day long and you would use, there was a freeness to you. Well, then you'd come home and boom, yeah. right back into the tiniest little corners of days. So I think the, the Las Vegas tourism commission really hit on something um, pretty brilliant with the, what stays in, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas because shame is, uh, is like, okay, so this doesn't belong as part of life. You mentioned allowed earlier and shame says this isn't allowed go on vacation. Now I'm in a separate place. Things are allowed now that aren't normally allowed, like sleeping late, going to restaurants, you know, all the things that you don't necessarily do day to day when well, sex fell into that. Okay. And then I would go back to life as though vacation weren't part of life. And, um, and now I would go back to life rules and what happens on vacation stays in vacation. Mm -hmm. And we have over time in, worked 
on that not not explicit not explicitly not the way i'm talking about it now but the result of the things we've talked about is oh yeah vacation is just an extension of life at home with you know in a different place and so like you said we've arranged vacations at home because they are the intentional this is how we're doing things now i think it's worth saying then that you could ritually set down yes shame as a this is so yes, an experiment and ex i'll i propose an experiment if you struggle with shame around sex and pleasure and enjoyment in general and it's come up over and over again but you go away on vacation and you find yourself able to access those parts of yourself with less shame barrier what if you contract with yourself an experiment um, okay, I'm going to ritually set down my shame for the next two hours. I'm going to say, this is vacation. I'm going to create that. Like Humans are fantastically capable of creating containers for themselves, yeah. of compartmentalizing. So we could use that compartmentalization in order to actively create a space to enjoy. That's great. So I would propose that since you aren't on vacation, but I am, um, that you perform a ritual for yourself, yeah. set down because yep. this, this remnant of shame, it still kicks around oh, and yeah. I see oh, it yeah. come up. It's there. Um, and we've talked about shame and sex and you specifically. Yeah. In Feeling it a little episodes. bit right now. Sure. Whereas shame doesn't come up as much for me or, I mean, it's, it's minimal around sex. What if you were to ritually set down shame what might that look like for you hmm. the act of creating the a act brief of ritual creating a uh, so um i would think about what represents the shame for me okay what um yeah, for me i think i would try to find an object sure and i would find i would think about a place to put that object where it would feel separate from where I was. If we were going to be in here in the house, then maybe I would bring it outside mm -hmm. and put it in another place. And um, I would verbalize it. I'd say, okay, this is, you are my shame. And I understand there's a lot going on here. And I will set you aside for now and come back and get you later. Because I don't. It is part of It you, is part of and me. You're it's not, not done working nope. with what this there's, is. There's a lot of, there's a lot of benefit to be had by working through what's in there. But right now, I don't want it in the way, so I'm going to set it over there. Yeah, I, I think that you're outlining a process that, well, it's outlined in in the book that I wrote, and it's it's something we talk about quite a lot. Creating ritual has been shown. It, it demonstrably increases relational happiness. Creating ritual for self makes space for the relationship you have with yourself which is connection to self better. matters so mm -hmm. so much i'm i love that idea i love that you said you'd find an object and so you're just thinking of something that's like here in the house mostly. yeah it's something you own already yeah I it's would just find... a you would look around mm -hmm. and find something that you're like oh this could represent so you're looking for the symbol the symbol the exactly. symbol yep. that can hold the archetypal energy of this shame for you and you give the symbol meaning by simply speaking, but, yep. by verbalizing. Yeah. And if you didn't want to verbalize, I, I think writing has worked very well for both of us as writing well. Writing would Sometimes be good too, yeah. I've even written down what I need to write and I'll like roll it, wrap it mm, around. That's what I was thinking. The, yeah, wrap the it around. object. And then, yeah, take it outside. Um, I performed a ritual just recently. I, I threw a small, a small little um, metal charm, threw it into our river because mm -hmm. I needed to let go of something. It was a, it was a, um, a moment This oh, here, this tiny little, teeny little quarter inch piece of, of metal. And I needed to let go of something. And when I did, oh, there, okay. When you, um, when you do that, when you set down shame and you come back into our relationship, are you, is there some piece of the ritual that you would complete as part of coming back into the house? to bring that vacation to now like invoke the vacation energy. Yeah. Okay. So I go out, I put it where I want it to be, say, or, you know, write or whatever. Come back. I think for myself, I would probably do something 
physical. Um, I mean, we have the river. I might just go get in the river. Yeah, you have been known like to take some very cold dips in the river. I like the the symbolism of the river washing stuff away. So I'd go down, immerse myself, let it take away all the the non vacationy. Or I could also, um, nothing wrong with this, come back in, have some ice cream. Oh, invite right? pleasure. Hey, what's what's about what's vacation about? It's about you know, vac- uh, ice cream or, um, or whatever it is, or watching or... a sunset, whatever it is that symbolizes vacation for you, that makes you think of vacation. And ice cream is one of those things. So yeah, that, that could do that. Um, vacation sex doesn't have to be for vacations anymore. That's what I'm hearing. Yes. Awesome. So I've been on vacation. You haven't, but we're going to do this experiment today. Yeah. Since we can. Yeah. Um, and I would love to hear if anybody else takes up the challenge. Oh, what happens yeah. if you create a container for some relationship time that is vacation worthy? Yeah, whatever it is that makes vacation feel like vacation for you. And then see what happens. See if that changes the way the, the erotic overlap happens. And yeah. If nothing else, the experiment gives you data. Yep. And from that data, we can figure out what happens next. I would love to hear from you. You can always reach out to me at Jolie at JolieHamilton.com or you can reach out to Ken at Ken at JolieHamilton.com. And yeah, just check in and let us know. I love to hear stories. I, I heard one last week of what happened when somebody listened to a specific episode. And I'm going to talk about that in a future episode. Oh, it's so It's so wonderful to hear what happens when when we listen to the insides of someone else's relating, we can often jostle open something that's been, that seemed impenetrable or, or inaccessible. Let's see if we can do that. That would be great. Awesome. Till then. Thanks for listening. Thanks everybody. for listening. Thank you for listening to the project relationship podcast with Dr. Jolie Hamilton and Ken Hamilton. If you're enjoying our conversation, we would be so grateful if you would drop a rating and quick review so more people will be able to find us. And if you have questions or suggestions that you of things you'd like us to tackle, please send an email to jolie at joliehamilton.com. I'd love to hear them. Project Relationship, the entrepreneur's action plan for passionate, sustainable love is available on Amazon in Kindle, soft or hardcover versions. This book is a succinct, practical guide to improving your love life. I wrote Project Relationship to give you a set of quick action tools and conversation guides that can transform a mediocre relationship into a fabulous one. These tools are based not just on what Jolie learned in her studies, but on what we actually do to make our relationship thrive. Until next time, remember, relationships can be messy, and that's good news.